to Community Evangelical Church. We're glad you're here. Um, we are excited about what God is doing uh, in our lives, and so we gather together to just bring worship to Him kind of out of that excitement. And I'm excited about this morning. Uh, we just, we had a, just a just beautiful time in God's presence in the first service, and we're just praying for that same uh, just presence of God in this service, and and just uh, coming before him in adoration and in worship. Uh, a couple things as we begin our service uh, in your bulletin is that bright green connection card. Uh, that is an opportunity for you to communicate, to connect with uh, the church and the church staff. And so I want to encourage you in that um, to take some time to um, fill that out. Uh, if you're visiting with us for the first time, we just want to welcome you as our friend. We're glad you're here, and uh, you are our guests, and we just hope that you feel welcomed and loved, and, uh, and that God uh, just reaches into your life and speaks to you today. Um, if you're a regular member of Community Church, um, we want you to fill that out as well. Um, you can, on the back, share with us any uh, concerns you have, any questions you have, uh, but mostly what we'd like uh, on the back of that is just for you to share um, prayer requests and, and uh, things that are happening in your life that you'd like the staff to pray for. Every Monday morning when we get together as a staff, we pray through all of those requests. So please take an opportunity to do that today. Um, and then as you leave, there's some baskets in the back. You can throw those in. Uh, a couple of announcements as we uh, begin our time together. Uh, we've been throughout the month of July collecting items for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, just um, different weeks, uh, different things. Uh, sometimes personal hygiene items, sometimes school supplies, sometimes uh, uh, just it's been a different item each week. Next week is the last week we're going to collect for that Christmas in July. And, uh, and, and next week's collection is just anything you forgot to bring in the past four weeks. So I can bring really any of those items next week. We collect those. And then uh, in the fall, the, uh, the, the children will take all of those items and they'll pack them into shoe boxes. They'll be sent kind of around the world uh, to really make a difference in the lives of children, uh, boys and girls all around the world. Immediately following this service uh, at 11.15 or so when we're done, um, we have our prayer uh, for healing. And so we have a team of people who gather together once a month uh, in room 118, or 119, excuse me, which is right out here. Uh, if you have a need in your heart, in your life, it might be a physical need, it might be a spiritual need, it might be an emotional need that you just like somebody to pray for. Um, that team would love to gather around you, pray for you, uh, anoint you with oil, and just pray for God's presence and his work. Uh, and his healing in your life. So you don't need a reservation. Just show up at that, uh, at that room, uh, room 119. Uh, next Sunday, we have a new to CEC gathering uh, that happens uh, the first Sunday of every month. And that's basically an opportunity. It's not a class. Uh, we don't go in. We don't teach you anything. It's just uh, some individuals who are there for you to ask questions. We'll tell you a little bit about kind of the history of the church, where we came from, a little bit about what's important to us, uh, but mostly it's just an opportunity for you to meet some people and learn about uh, Community Evangelical Church. And finally, uh, on August 6th, we have another fan night. That's for our City League uh, softball team. I want to encourage you to come out on August 6th and support them. It's a great opportunity to encourage them, get behind them, root for them uh, as they play softball, and let them know that we uh, love and appreciate them. We have gathered together today uh, to worship. And uh, worship is about coming before God in surrender, in love, in, in, in just recognition of all he's done in our lives, and just kind of lavishing upon him our praise. And I love how David reminds us of who God is and his, how deserving he is of our worship. And so as I read from Psalm 18, Allow these words to kind of maybe um, just stir within you a gratitude for God. And allow that stirring to be the thing that causes you to worship him this morning. David says this, I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield. 
the power that saves me in my place of safety. I call on the Lord, who is worthy of praise, and he saves me from all of my enemies. This morning, we recognize all that God is to us, and we gather together to worship him. So would you pray with me as we invite him to join us here? God, this morning, we, uh, we come into this room for a lot of different reasons. But I pray that you would cast those all aside and bring us all to a unified place of one reason to be here, and that is to worship you. We want to see you this morning. We want to um, glorify you. We want to experience you. And so, God, we just pray that you would meet us here and that as you're moving in this place, that we would just pour out our hearts to you in worship. We love you. We, we praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you now to stand and say hello to those who have gathered to worship with you.
sing your praises before the gods. I bow before your holy temple as I worship. I praise your name for your unfailing love and faithfulness. For your promises are backed by all the honor of your name.
in the reality of the depth of his love for you. He knows everything about you. He knows every action you have ever done, every sin you've ever committed. He knows every thought that's ever crossed your mind, every word that's come across your lips. And he still loves you. He loves you so intensely that he died for you. And so often we, we, when we think of the, the person and, and power of God, when we think of Jesus, we come before him expecting to be met with judgment. But he meets us with love. We expect to be shunned and shamed. But he meets us with embrace. God, we don't know how to say thank you enough. We're so unworthy. Every time we walk into your presence, you just embrace us. You offer this incredible forgiveness. And you just are seeking intimacy, a relationship, connection. You want to know us and you want us to know you.
God, forgive us for trying to earn your love. Your acceptance. Trying to earn your approval. Trying to go through all the right motions, say all the right things, do all the right things to gain significance in your eyes. When you've already given us significance. When you've already given us love. When you've already given us acceptance. Thank you, God, for loving us in such an incredible way. For embracing us and opening your arms of embrace to us. This morning, we want to walk into your arms and embrace you back. We want to express our love to you. We want to express our gratitude, our appreciation for your great love. We want to express our adoration for who you are. In our frailty and our lack of words, we want to express to you your glory and honor you and praise you this morning. So receive that worship, we pray. Thank you for meeting us here, God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you that when we come before you, we can come as we are. We can bear our hearts and our souls to you. Thank you for caring about us, caring about what's going on in our lives. We pray, oh God, that you would continue to work and move in each person, in each need that is expressed, that is carried into this room this morning. We pray especially for those who are dear to us, who cannot be here. We think of Sandy Schroll. We love Sandy. She's been such a a beautiful face that showed the love of God. And God, as her and John walk into this difficult time of their lives, as they've been met with this kind of out of the blue diagnosis of liver cancer, as Sandy faces difficult treatment and a long road ahead and a grim prognosis, God, I pray that you would just envelop them in your arms. May they feel your presence and your love. May they have confidence in your promises. God, we would pray for her healing, that you might be glorified. John as well, and their children and their families. We also pray for uh, Bill Fenstemaker's brother-in-law, Barry, who just um, talking to Bill and Karen this morning, they were just sharing the pain that he's in with this bone cancer that he's been diagnosed with. God, you, you allow things in our lives for a reason. And we know that Barry does not know you. He actually been in a place where he's rejected you. God, we're grateful that through this we're starting to see his heart open. And I pray that through this time you would surround him with people who know you and love you and can lavish your love and the hope of you upon him. That he might even turn his face to you. Put his trust and his faith work and move in his life be with his wife Lorraine as well and encourage her and just be near them give Bill and Karen words and actions that would express your love to them God we're grateful for the way you are moving in our presence and we would invite you we would beg of you that you would continue to move and that you would move more we love you in Jesus name you 
thousand times I tried to hear from heaven but I talked the whole time I think I made you too small I never feared you at all no if you touched my face would I know you looked into your eyes could I behold you what do I know of you who spoke me into motion where have I even stood but the shore along your ocean are you fire are you fury are you sacred are you beautiful so what do I about how you were mighty to save but those were only empty words on a page then I caught a glimpse of who you might be the slightest hint of you brought me down to my knees what do I know of you who spoke where have I even stood but the shore along your ocean? Are you fire? Are you fury? Are you sacred? Are you, are you beautiful? So what do I know? What do I know of holy? Today's scripture reading comes from Psalm 138, beginning with verse 1 and ending in verse 8. <clears throat> I give you thanks, O Lord, with all my heart. I will sing your praises before the gods. I bow before your holy temple as I worship. I praise your name for your unfailing love and faithfulness, for your promises are backed by all the honor of your name. As soon as I pray, you answer me, you encourage me, by giving me strength. 
Every king in all the earth will thank you, Lord, for all of them will hear your words. Yes, they will sing about the Lord's ways, for the glory of the Lord is very great. Though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. Though I am surrounded by troubles, you will protect me from the anger of my enemies. You reach out with your hand, and the power of your right hand saves me. The Lord will work out his plans for my life. For your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. Don't abandon me, for you made me. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Thank you, Josh, for reading God's word for us. And uh, Tammy, again, just thank you for truly leading us in the worship of our God this morning. So uh, we want to pray and ask God to just speak to and uh, in, to us this morning and in our presence. So would you pray with me? Lord God, this morning, um, I do believe that you want to do something in our presence. I believe you have something very special for us this morning that, that your spirit wants to reveal your heart to us. That you want us to do more than just hear a sermon or hear words. Um, but you, God, you truly do desire to reveal yourself to us this morning. And so uh, I, would, I would pray, O oh God, and we would collectively pray that you would move in our presence. That you would open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds. That we might receive what your spirit is saying to us. And God, I would pray that you would take the words that, um, that I say, that God, you would put them in my mouth, and that you would carry them into our ears, that Father, this whole time would just be a time where your spirit moves and um, does a work that only you can do. So we give this time to you, oh God, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So yesterday, uh, I saw a, a light at the end of the tunnel for the first time in a long time. We have been uh, remodeling our kitchen. Uh, it started about a year, more than a year ago, probably a year and three months ago. Um, Beth and I were talking about remodeling our kitchen. Uh, we have a, a, a big open space, and in the one end of our kitchen, there was a wall that came out. It came out about four feet. It went across about four feet, and then it went back. So it took about, you know, this big section of our kitchen, it just took away, there was this wall, and it was like weird, and didn't know what was behind it. And we had a drop ceiling at the time, and so I crawled up there, and I looked down in there, and it was mostly just open, empty space. It had a couple of pipes in it. So Beth uh, said to her dad, hey, can you come over and um, help move those pipes kind of closer to the wall so that we can regain some of this space in our kitchen. He was like, sure. Um, we, we thought, you know, we'll do this in a couple of months. Well, he called like two days later, and he was like, what are you guys doing tomorrow? And we said, working. He said, I'm coming to your house to start your kitchen. And we were like, we are not ready for this even remotely. But he came over, and he ripped our ceiling out, and he ripped this wall out, and he moved the pipes. And so for about nine months, we lived with no ceiling in our kitchen and just a disaster. Well, finally, Beth and I both were like, this is awful. We need to do something. So I started working, and I drywalled the ceiling, and I, I you know, patched in this box and made it a much smaller box. We gained floor space. Uh, we, we tore the, the floors out and put all new floors in. I tore the countertops out and made concrete countertops to go in there. I, I just, we redid the cabinets. We did all of this work. And yesterday, for the first time, our kitchen started to look clean. And it's like, oh. You know, we love having company over, but we haven't had anyone to our house in like a year because we just, the kitchen hasn't been usable to be able to serve uh, anyone. It's been awful. And so finally, we started to see this disaster taking shape. And I think as we look at the book of Malachi, that's kind of the picture that we have. With the people of Judah, uh, the, who are part of God's chosen people, the Israelites, and, uh, and, and God is coming in, and through Malachi, he is shining a light on their existence. And what we see is a mess. 
But what God desires to do is start to put the pieces back together and start to bring them to this place of beauty once again. And so as we get into this section of chapter 3, we're going to see God kind of hit, um, this is like right in the center of the book of Malachi, and he's going to hit the core of their issues. And so there's, um, there's just a ton of stuff kind of packed into these verses, and so uh, stick with me. We're going to do a little bit of just kind of a broad stroke overview, but my hope is that we get to the heart of God and what he's desiring for the people of Israel. So he starts here in verse um, verse 10, and he says, Are we not all the children of the, are we not all children of the same father? Are we not all created by the same God? Then why do we betray each other, violating the covenant of our ancestors? God's going to start here as he kind of gets to the heart. He's, he's talked to the priest the last couple of weeks, and he's going to talk to the people, and he's going to get a, at the heart of their brokenness. And he's going to deal with three things. He's going to deal with their relationships with each other, their relationship with him, and their marriages. And he's going to talk about those three things. And I think that he's going to deal with them, and they're the same issues that we still struggle with today. The first thing that he approaches, though, is this idea of fractured friendships. He goes in and he confronts the people of Israel. He says, look, don't we all share the same father? Don't we all share the same God? Yet, your relationships with each other are a disaster. On two different levels, they, you know, there's the very practical, uh, personal level where, you know, they had uh, this hierarchical system where, you know, the people of this class didn't talk to the people of this class. They were, they were gossiping about each other. They were, um, there were the haves and the have-nots. I mean, the people of Israel in their interpersonal relationships were a mess. But beyond that, looking at it on a bigger scale, they also had experienced this incredible fracturing of who they were as a nation. Coming out of uh, being birthed out of Abraham, God had said, I will set you apart as my children, as my chosen people. You will be, he said to Abraham, your descendants will be this great nation and they will number uh, uh, as the stars in the sky or the sands on the seashore. And so as this nation grows, we see after King David, this splintering of the nation. You have have 10 tribes in the north that become the, the people of Israel. You have two tribes in the south that become the people of Judah. And there's this fracturing of a nation. And each of the tribes kind of has their own tribal identity. And they're all, they're all kind of separated. And there's all this division. And God says, as my people it breaks my heart that you are so divided because what we see as the heart of god from the beginning of scripture to the end of scripture is that his people live together in unity and love god desires that his people more than just externally in some kind of um, external set of behaviors, God desires his people to be unified and to genuinely love one another. And this problem that existed so long ago is still an issue for the church. We still have issues where the people who sit back over there with their friends don't like to sit over here because they don't like the people. They don't like the people up here. Okay, I'm not saying like, you guys are okay. There's not a group back there that hates you all. Um, but we've had that. Like I've had people who say, oh, I don't sit on that side of the sanctuary because so-and-so sits over there. You know what? We ought to be ashamed of that. And the reality is, you may not have said that, but there are other people who are part of the family of God that you have allowed difficulty, frustration, and hurt to bring division to the family of God because we have harbored those emotions, those hurts, and
and that bitterness in our hearts. And that breaks the heart of God. God has called his people to unity. So much so that when Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross, he prays this prayer. It's found in John 17. My prayer is not for the world. Like, um, how many of you ever watched Miss America contest, right? Um, you get Miss America, she's up there, and they're like, what's your greatest wish? I just wish for world peace and harmony, right? How many of you ever heard that? Like, and so like, we, we, like, Jesus like, God, my wish is not for world harmony and world peace. Like, I'm not looking for everybody to get along, but he says, my prayer is for those you have given me because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they may bring me glory. Now I'm departing from the world, and they are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name. Why? So that they will be united just as you and I are united. The consistent message, one of the consistent messages all throughout Scripture is that God's desire is that His people would live in unity together. And it's a place, it's a way that the enemy so quickly, so desperately, so consistently attacks the church because if you can be mad at him and he can be mad at her and she can be mad at her and we keep these bitterness and these angry feelings and this gossip that tears apart and all of these feelings, if this can rule in us, we cannot be the effective church of Jesus Christ. And so God, even back then to his people, through the prophet Malachi says, why do you betray each other, violating the covenant of our ancestors? He goes then from the personal relationships, the friendships of people, and he moves into their faith, to their relationship with him. And we're going to see not only a fractured friendship, but we're going to see a fractured faith. Starting in verse 11, it says, Judah has been unfaithful. And a detestable thing has been done in Israel and in Jerusalem. The men of Judah have defiled the Lord's beloved sanctuary by marrying women who worship idols. May the Lord cut off the nation of Israel, cu cut off from the nation of Israel every last man who has done this, and yet brings an offering to the Lord of heaven's armies. Here is another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with your tears, weeping and groaning because he pays no attention to your offerings and doesn't accept them with pleasure. You cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnesses the vows you and your wife made when you were young. But you have been unfaithful to her. Though she remains faithful, your faithful partner, the wife of your marriage vows. And so he kind of ends that section with marriage, and we're going to get that to that in a second. But he starts this section with the people's worship of him, their relationship to him. And what does he say? He says, you have been unfaithful to me. He uses the marriage illustration. And we see that throughout Scripture. The New Testament calls the church the bride of Christ. And so we see this marriage illustration. So he's using the illustration and he says, you people of Judah have been unfaithful to me by marrying these women who are uh, worshiping other idols. Now, notice what the men are doing. They're still coming into the temple. They're still bringing sacrifices. They have done everything right. They've walked through all the right motions. They've believed all of the right thing. Their theology is spot on. Their behavior 
is pretty good. They know all the rules. They're obeying all the rules. Yet God says to them, you disgust me. And they're like, what's going on, God? We don't, we don't get it. You're not accepting our offerings. We're bringing them. And, and, and I love what he says here. Um, you, you, uh, you cover the Lord's altar with tears and we keep weeping and groaning because he pays no attention to your offerings. Um, and so, so the picture here, uh, how many of you ever, as a parent, how many of you ever had a child um, who doesn't get their way? and they start that crying. You know, and sometimes you even get the crocodile tears, like there's these big tears. That's kind of the picture of what's going on here. They're like, God, we've done everything right. We believe all the right things. We say all the right things. We're keeping all the right rules. Where is, what's going on here? And God says, your hearts have not been faithful to me. Where God goes is not to the beliefs of the people or the behaviors of the people, but to the very heart and core of the people. And this, I think, is one of the greatest struggles of the church today, is we work and we teach and we push theology. And so many in this room could teach a theology class. Your theology is perfect. You've got it all lined up. You've got all your ducks in a row. And if it's not theology, it's behavior. We do all the right things. We know the do's. We know the don'ts. We follow all the rules. We even read our Bibles every day. And God says, what's missing is your heart. He uses the marriage illustration for a reason. Ladies, go somewhere with me for a second. If I could give you the world's most perfect husband, most of you would be like, yes, please. I could offer you a husband who brings you flowers every day. When he gets home, he cooks dinner, and then he cleans up dinner. And then he goes out and mows the grass, and pulls all the weeds. And then after he's done with that, he comes inside and rubs your feet, draws a bath, puts a mint on your pillow, carries you to bed, lays you, lays you out. All is good. He says, what can I do for you, honey? You wake up in the morning, your coffee's brewed. I mean, it is, he is perfect. Sounds pretty good to most of us, right? What's that? Yeah, sounds good, right? One caveat. He's got a woman on the side. You okay with that? No. Guys, I could give you the perfect wife. She is gorgeous without flaw. She cooks, she cleans, she bakes, she rubs your feet, she mows the grass. but she's got another man on the side. How many are you okay with that? None of us. Why? Because we recognize in our marriages that what we desire more than anything else is the heart and the passionate connection to our spouse. That's what we want. We want somebody whose heart is fully devoted to us. In all circumstances, at all times, we frankly don't care if they leave their socks out every once in a while, or sometimes their hair is messy. We don't care about some of these other things because our real concern is, do I have your heart? And we think that the God we serve, the God we love, is after our right theology and our right behaviors. And we think it's okay if we let our hearts wander a little bit. And we have some idols on the side. Some things that creep in and grab our attention greater than Him. From the very start, 
as the people of Israel being raised up as the chosen people of God. Through Moses, God said to them, what I want is your heart. The Pharisees knew this, and they actually tried to trick Jesus. In Matthew, we read a story where Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees came along one day, and they thought they would get Jesus. They would catch him in a trap. So they said to him, Jesus, what's the most important commandment? What behavior trumps all other behaviors? What belief trumps all other beliefs? Fully expecting him to say, the most important thing about being a follower of God is the command in the Old Testament that says you should not mix cotton and wool together and have a fabric that's a collie-potten blend. They expected him to go to don't murder, don't steal, don't do this, don't do that. They wanted to trick him into it. And Jesus' reply was this. You must love the Lord your God. Again, bring in the marriage picture. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two things. Jesus basically says this, if your heart, if your soul, if your mind, if it is fully sold out in passionate love for, the, for your heavenly Father, everything else is going to fall in line. Your beliefs, your theology is going to come to the right place. Your behaviors are going to come to the right place. Jesus says what's important is your love for God. It's going to work out, but we start here with the heart. But we've created a religious system as a church that says, here's our set of things you've got to believe. And here's the set of, set of things you've got to do. Just like the people of Israel did. God recognized through Malachi and said, look, you're doing the right things, but what lacks is your heart. They should have known this from the very beginning. Way back when, Moses said to them, in the book of Deuteronomy, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. This is known to the Jewish people, has always been known to them as the Shema. It's a prayer that they pray every single day. And it's interesting when they pray the Shema. We saw people in Israel doing this. Um, this, is, this is what it looks like in Hebrew. Now, I don't expect most of you to be able to read that. Um, I actually can't read most of it. Um, a couple of words here and there I can pick out. But this is what they do every single day. When entering into the presence of God in prayer, they, did say, they do this. Shema Israel. Adonai Elohim. Adonai Ehad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord And they don't do this to test themselves. Like, oh, see if you can do it for memory without looking at the screen or looking at your page. They do this because at the very beginning they recognized that loving God was about letting go of this. Loving God was not about all of this stuff in the external world. It wasn't about their sets of theology it wasn't about their sets of behavior. What God desired from them on an everyday basis was for them to shut that all out and say, God, today I want to love you with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my strength. And they fell into a very easy pattern, a 
of trying to create rules and trying to create behaviors and trying to create belief systems. And somewhere along the line, they let aside the heart. And I suggest that for most of us in this room, we've created the same religious pattern. We've worked to learn and believe the right things. We've worked, worked to, to kind of beat our bodies into shape so that we do the right things. But we have forgotten that what God wants from us is for us to know Him, for Him to, uh, for him to know us. God wants to know you. Some of you start picking up your Bibles and you read your Bibles every day and you fall into this pattern of saying, I gotta read my Bible because it's what I gotta do. It's what a good Christian does. I've been guilty of this app on my phone that I love. It takes me through Bible readings and I commit myself to read, read the Bible every day and read through the Bible in a year. And there are days where I'll pull out my Bible and be like, oh, this is what I gotta do. I gotta read my Bible so that I can check it off. And I think God would say, I don't care if you read two words in Scripture. If you do it so that you can enter into intimacy with me, that's all I care about. Some of us have grand prayer lists. And we go through and we talk through them and we tell God what we want and we tell, them what we need, tell Him what we need. But if we are talking to God, for the sake of doing something we're supposed to do. We're not stopping to listen and converse with Him. We are walking through religious behaviors. And God would say, as He said to the people of Israel, I reject So as he challenges them in their relationships, their friendships with others, and he moves into his relationship with them, he's going to move to this place of saying, you know what, the place this has made itself most noticeable is in your relationships with the person you're supposed to be most intimate with, in your marriages. We're going to see fractured marriages. Chapter, or uh, verse 15 didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and in spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart and do not be unfaithful to your wife. God says, look, marriage is a picture of my relationship with you. It was in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament. God has given us marriage as a picture of his connection, his love, his intimacy with his church. He said to the people of Israel, you see fractured friendships, you see fractured relationship with me, and the way that's playing out is with in fractured marriages. God says, I hate divorce because it is a broken picture of what I desire. This intimacy with you, this connection with you, God's heart, his desire is for faithfulness and connection and intimacy. What God wants to see from your marriage and my marriage is not this set of, of, of rules that we follow. You know, a good husband does this, 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 and this. And a good wife does this, 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 and this. What God desires to see marriages that thrive, that are an example to the world around us of what it means to live in intimacy. Man, it breaks my heart to say this, but I remember a number of years ago, Beth and I were going through this, um, uh, through a time of, of just 
struggle in our marriage. And I remember I was trying everything I could to do everything right. She said, I want you. And I'm like, but I do the dishes. I cook dinner. I, I do this. I do this. I do this. And she said, on paper, you are the world's perfect husband. I don't care anything about that. What I want is you. And praise God, he has transformed the way I view my marriage. And I, I, I would, I would be a lie if I stood up here and said I have a perfect marriage. But man, I want to drive to God. Would you transform my marriage? And would you make it a picture of what you desire for your relationship with the church? In Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul says, And furthermore, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. He has this picture of intimacy. He goes on, he says, Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. He expounds on that. We did that a few months ago as we walked through Family Matters Month. We talked about things we can do to have these incredible marriages, marriages that just reflect the glory of God to the world around us. And marriages like that are built on intimacy. We talked about serving each other sacrificially. We talked about communicating with each other intentionally. We talked about forgiving each other consistently. We talked about um, pursuing Christ individually. But we said every good marriage is built on a secure foundation. It's a foundation of intimacy. It is a foundation of the solid rock of Christ. Strong, healthy, thriving marriages start with daily inviting the person of the Holy Spirit in to move and work and transform you as individuals and as a couple. One of the greatest tools that the enemy uses to destroy the church and destroy cultures is the breakup of marriage I was reading one commentary and it shared actually a couple different commentaries talked about this um, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire Roman Empire one of the greatest strongest most amazing empires ever to exist in our in our world and if you read about the fall of the Roman Empire what you will read is that most scholars believe that it wasn't external um, enemies that destroyed the Roman Empire. They will point to a transition in the culture that broke down marriages as the foundation for the breakup of that empire. And if you look at our world and you look at our culture, we see around us marriage and family that is being destroyed and torn apart. God desires for his church to have marriages that are strong and healthy. And let me just pause and say a word because some of you that kind of hits you heavy because you've experienced a failed marriage. You've experienced divorce. You've experienced unfaithfulness. Maybe you have been unfaithful. Can I just tell you the beauty of Scripture is that God says, I, I know, and I love you, and I give you my grace and my forgiveness, and I want to start today building exactly what I desire for you. And so know that there is forgiveness and grace, but know this that God wants each and every one of us from this day forward to be living these marriages, these lives, these friendships that invite on a daily basis, a moment-to-moment -moment basis, invite the Spirit to indwell and move, invite the presence of God into our marriages, into our lives, so that we can be a united testimony to the world of this is what it means to be followers of Jesus so that God 
through his, in, 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 in his perfect plan, can experience the unity and intimacy with his children that he desires. So often in church, and I'm, I apologize, I'm so guilty. We end a sermon, we end a, a, a Bible study with let's work to change these behaviors. And there are times in life we need to change these behaviors. But more than anything, what God says is, I'm not looking for you to change behaviors. What I'm looking for you is to dive deep with me. To live in intimacy with me. And as you allow me to enter in, as you experience and live in intimacy with me, I'll take care of those behaviors. I'll take care of those theologies. We'll get all of that taken care of. But what I want is your heart. And I believe so many of us in this room have lived great religious lives. And so many of us in this room, God is impressing on us this overwhelming desire to let that behind, to chase after him in intimacy. For some of you, that's in, in your personal relationships, in your relationships with other followers of Jesus. For some of you, that's in intimacy with him. And for some of you, it is in your marriage that God wants to just invade, and you want him to invade. And so this morning, we're going to give you an opportunity to just respond. Just say, you know what, that's me. I, I, I want, I, I need intimacy in this area or this area, or this area. I just want to dive into that intimacy with Jesus. And so we're going to do, we're just going to give you a chance. We're going to invite you to just come forward. And I'd love to just pray for you and over you. We have some people who would love to come alongside of you and pray with you. So we're, gonna, we're just going to, um, Karen's going to come. She's going to pray before we, um, before we uh, close with a closing song. And, you know, one of the things about times like this, times of invitation, um, so many of you grew up in the church, and, you, and, and you've, go, you've been in church, and, and you've gone to, like, camp meetings and things. And so, like, the time of an invitation comes, right? And, and what does it mean? The people who go forward, what does it mean? <gasps> they are horrible, sinful, terrible people. Okay? I, I just believe God wants to break us of that. I think walking forward is not about saying I'm a horrible, rotten, terrible person, but I think it means, you know what? God moved in my heart, and I just want to make a public, I, I just want to cement what he's doing in me. And so we just want to, we want to, culturally as a church to move to this place where it is not like taboo it is not judgmental for somebody to walk forward and say can somebody pray with me man you can walk forward because God's doing something awesome you just need to share that with somebody and you can walk forward because God has moved in you and you just want to submit that and you can walk forward because God is challenging you and you just want to surrender so this morning, I think God, I think God is challenging some of us, and He's encouraging some of us, and He is cheering some of us on. And so, just as a, as kind of that step of culture change, I'm going to invite you to come forward. And when you see somebody walking forward, or maybe you're walking forward with them, you know, maybe, maybe pray for them. Maybe celebrate with them. Maybe allow your, your mind to go to a good place for them instead of a, oh, I never thought Michael was such a sinner. I guess he is. Can we just celebrate together when somebody comes forward? Can we make that in our midst a beautiful thing? So I'm going to pray, and Karen's going to pray. Karen's going to keep playing. Um, just a moment, the worship team's going to come and lead us in a closing song.
So this morning, if God is moving in you, and you know, maybe you come forward individually, maybe you and your spouse just want to grab hands and say, you know what, honey, together, let's, let's go forward and let's just commit our marriage to having Jesus through the person of the Spirit just move in us on a regular basis. Can I just make that invitation to you? Let me pray. I'm just going to invite the worship team to come forward. We're going to do it that way. And as they're singing, uh, we want to invite you to come forward and sing with them. So God, as we enter into this time, we're going to pray that your spirit will continue moving. As we sing this closing song, recognizing your faithfulness to us, Father, we want to surrender faithfulness to you. We want to invite you to enter into our relationships, into our marriages. And God, we want to invite you to come to a place of intimacy with us in our lives. We love you. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name.
Father, I pray that you would move more. More in the hearts of every person in this room, more in the collective congregation of community of Angelical Church. God, may your spirit move in such a way that we as your people become a bright and shining light, a beacon of hope, a beacon of love, a beacon of your presence. God, we want to experience intimacy with you. We want to love you with all of our hearts, all of our souls, and all of our strength. Father, I pray over every person in this room, those who walked forward this morning and those who didn't, that, God, you would invade their lives, invade their marriages, invade their relationships, invade their time alone with you in such a way that, God, you would draw them deep 